Now, our first speaker is a rare breed of top-class scientist and top-class entrepreneur. He has about 45 patents. He speaks in TEDs around the world. He is from the agricultural faculty, and in his spare time, because he has so much of it, he makes delicious wine. I am very proud to present Professor Oded Shoseov. Thank you very much. Well, 200 years of uh, modern science and uh, industrial revolution, we have to admit that uh, our performance is not that great. The machines we build continue uh, to suffer from mechanical failures. The houses we build uh, do not survive severe earthquakes. Yet we shouldn't be so critical about our scientists for a simple reason. We didn't have much time. 200 years is not enough time to make perfect materials. While nature had three billion years to develop some of the most amazing materials that we wish we had in our possession. Remember, these materials have a quality assurance of three billion years. And that's amazing. Take, for example, sequoia trees. They carry hundreds of tons for hundreds of years in cold weather, in sun, UV light. Yet, if you look into the structure of this tree by high-resolution electron microscopy and ask yourself, what is it really made of? Surprisingly, it's made of sugar. Yes, the same sugar, oops, yep, the same sugar we use in our tea, well, not exactly. It's actually a polymer of that sugar that is called cellulose. Well, not even that. It's actually a nanofiber made of cellulose, which is about 400 nanometer in length and about 5 to 10 nanometer in width. And the most amazing thing about this material it is that it is so strong, on a weight basis, it is 10 times stronger than steel. Yet, it's made of sugar. So, scientists all over the world, uh, for the last 10 years, believe that nanocellulose is going to be one of the most important nanomaterials for the entire industry. But here's the problem. Say you want to buy half a ton of nanocellulose to build a boat or an airplane, well, you can Google, you can eBay, you can even Alibaba. You won't find it. Well, of course, you're going to find thousands of papers of scientists saying how wonderful this material, but no commercial source. So about seven years ago, we at the Hebrew University, together with our partners from Sweden, decided to develop a cost-effective industrial scale method and process to make nanocellulose. And of course, we didn't want to cut trees, so we were looking for another alternative source of raw material, and we found one, which is the sludge of the paper industry. And the reason is there is a lot of that. In fact, Europe alone makes 12 million tons of that sludge annually. This is the equivalent of a mountain three kilometer high sitting on a soccer field, and we produce this mountain in Europe every year. So for everybody, it's an environmental problem. For us, it's a gold mine. So today in Israel, we established a company together with our Swedish partners, and these days we are producing on industrial scale in Israel nanocellulose for the first time. And in fact, these days, the second factory, which is slightly larger, is now built in Sweden. So the question is, what can you do with that? Well, lots of things. For example, we have shown that by adding just tiny amount, only a few percent of nanocellulose into cotton fibers, the same material that my shirt is made of, we can increase the mechanical properties dramatically. And by doing that, we'll be able to produce in the future uh, really excellent textiles, super performing textiles for medical applications and industrial applications. Another interesting example is actually now, these days, it's being showcased in the Venice Biennale for architecture, where we've, we've been able to develop a self-supporting structure. In this case, it's a, it's a shield uh, that uh, you can uh, build in the desert, all made of nanocellulose. Well, nature actually didn't stop its wonders in the plant kingdom. 
Take, for example, in the insect kingdom, cat fleas. Cat fleas have the, this wonderful ability to jump about 100 times their height. This is quite remarkable. In fact, it's the equivalent of a person standing in the middle of Liberty Island in New York and in a single jump go to the top of the Statue of Liberty. So this is great and I'm sure everybody would like to have this performance and the question is how cat fleas do it? It turns out that during evolution they've been able to develop this wonderful protein which is called resilin. Resilin in simple words is the most elastic material on earth. Actually the best rubber I can say. You can stretch it, you can squish it and it doesn't lose almost any energy to the environment. And once we release it, snap, it brings back all the energy. So, I'm sure everybody would like to have resilient, but here's the problem. Cat fleas are jumpy, so it's very difficult to catch them. <laughs> but, it's actually enough to catch one. And now, all you have to do is to extract the DNA of that cat flea, clone the gene that encodes for the resilient, in a less jumpy organism, like a plant or E. coli. And that's exactly what we did. So now we have the ability to produce lots of resin, and we can do a lot of things with that. Well, my team at the university decided to do something really cool. They decided to try and combine the strongest material produced by the plant kingdom, the nanocellulose, with the most elastic material produced in the insect kingdom, the resin. And the end result is quite amazing material that, in fact, enable us to make extremely strong films which are tough, elastic, and transparent. So what can you do with that? A lot of things. You know, sports shoes, next generation sports shoes that will enable us to jump higher, run faster. And, in fact, lots of other things, like, for example, touch screens. Touch screens that will be strong, and will not uh, break so easily as they often happen today. Well, our doctors continue to screw and glue medical implants made of synthetic materials in our body. And I'm going to say that this is not a good idea. Why? Because they fail. They fail just like they say plastic fork, because it's not strong enough, but sometimes they are too strong and in fact their mechanical properties do not really fit the surrounding tissues. But the reason is actually much more fundamental. The reason is that in nature things are done totally differently. In nature there is no one that takes my head and screw it into my neck. Or take my skin and glue it onto my body. In nature everything is self-assembled and developed. <coughs> Every living cell, whether it's coming from a plant, insect, or human being, has a DNA. And the DNA encodes for nanobio building blocks. Many times there are proteins, other times there are enzymes that make other materials like polysaccharides, fatty acids. But the one common thing about all these nanobio building blocks is that they need no one. They recognize each other and they have the ability to self assemble into structures, scaffolds on which cells are growing, proliferating, developed into tissues that together makes the organs and together brings life. So 10 years ago, we decided at Hebrew University, in my lab, to focus on probably the most important nanobio building block for us, for human, which is collagen. Why collagen? Because collagen accounts for about 25% of our dry weight. Other than uh, uh, water, we have nothing more than collagen. Give you a few examples. Uh, bone. Bone is about 50% collagen, 50% mineral. Our skin about 70% collagen. Tendons and ligaments close to 100% collagen. So I always like to say that anyone who is in the business of replacement parts for human being would like to have collagen. Well, admittedly, even before we started, 10 years ago, there were already on the market more than 1,000 medical implants that are made of collagen. For example, this dermal filler to reduce wrinkles and uh, augment lips. 
uh, other more sophisticated implants like uh, heart valves, for example. So where's the problem? I just told you that they were already there. Well, here's the problem. The source. The source of all these collagen is dead bodies. Dead pigs, dead cows, and even human cadaver. So risk is a big factor, but it's not the only one. Also the quality. Now here, I have a personal interest. This is my father, Tzvi Shoseo, in our winery. Seven years ago, a heart valve, similar to the one I just showed you, was implanted in his body. Now, the medical, uh, 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 the medical uh, literature say that these heart valves start to fail 10 years after the operation. No wonder. They are made of old, used, dead tissue. Just like this wall made of bricks that are falling apart. Yes, of course, we can take those bricks and build a new wall, but it's not going to be the same. And in fact, the FDA in 2007 already made a notice and a warning asking the companies to start to look for better alternatives. And that's exactly what we did. We decided to clone all the five human genes they are responsible for making type 1 collagen in human into a plant, into a tobacco plant. So that's exactly what we did. We, in fact, isolated all the five human genes and cloned them into a single tobacco plant. Now you may ask me, why tobacco, a plant with such a bad reputation? Well, there are many reasons. First of all, tobacco do not, just like any other plant, do not uh, uh, transfer uh, human pathogens. But in addition to that, it is not in the food and the feed chain. So it's much more safe to introduce human genes into that plant. And furthermore, we can grow it all year round. So we can supply the factory with fresh leaves with collagen, brand new collagen. So today in Israel, we have on a commercial scale, 25,000 square meter of greenhouses all over the country. The, from the Golan Heights, in the Upper Galilee, in the middle of the country, in Hatseva, in the Arava, and most recently, even in the uh, Jordan Valley, where the farmers receive these small plantlets of tobacco that look exactly like a regular tobacco, except that they have five human genes, which are responsible for making type 1 collagen. We grow the plants for about 50 to 70 days, depending on the time of the year, harvest the leaves, and the leaves are then transported by cooling trucks to the factory to extract the brand new collagen. And the process goes like that. If you ever seen or ever made a pesto, it's essentially the same thing. You crush the leaves, you get the juice with the collagen, concentrated protein. The protein is then transported into clean rooms where we do the final purification, from which we make different medical implants. And in fact, today, we have already one product that is already on the market, approved in Europe, which is a flowable gel for diabetic foot ulcer. And we are also developing other products like bone void filler, another product which is now actually uh, for tendon uh, repair for tendonitis, which is in the middle of uh, clinical trials in three centers in Israel, including uh, Hadassah. So, guys, I'm not talking about science fiction. This is happening today. In fact, more recently, we've been able to extrude, using textile methods, collagen fibers which are six times stronger than Achilles tendon. So together with uh, our, uh, our collaborators from Ireland, we decided to do something really cool. Remember the resilient? we decided to combine now the resilin from the insects with the collagen fibers. And the result is amazing. In fact, we've been able to make a super collagen fiber with only 5% resilin that is about 300%, 380% more tough and 300% more elastic. So oddly enough, in the future, when we will make artificial tendons and ligaments from that material, the patient that will receive that implant will have better performance after the surgery than he had before the injury. 
So what's for the future? We believe that in the future we'll be able to produce all the different nanobio building blocks that nature provided to us, like collagen, resin, nanocellulose, and many others. That will enable us to make better machines, and even heart. Now this heart is not gonna be the same as we can get from a donor. It will be better. It will perform better and will last longer. And I'm gonna summarize by quoting a good friend of mine, Sion Suleiman, who once told me this smart sentence. He said, if you want a new idea, you should open an old book. And I'm gonna say that the book was written. The book was written three, over three billion years of evolution. And the text is the DNA of life. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. All we have to do is read that text and embrace nature's gift to us. Thank you.